Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Warsaw Baptist Church. We've got quite a few people on vacation over here, so we're a little lopsided. Uh, hopefully the church will be fine. The building will stand. Um, we have a couple announcements or prayer requests that I want to get to before we get started with our praise and worship. Uh, just to get started, my name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you have any questions uh, about what you hear or what, what goes on here, just uh, come see me or Todd over here. He's one of our other elders. Uh, we'd love to tell you all about what we do here. Um, if you are new to Warsaw Baptist Church, we want to welcome you. If you're a visitor or a guest, we want to welcome you. We want to welcome uh, the lost and the found. We want to welcome the, the struggling and the not struggling. We want to welcome everybody here. Um, and we want to start off with some prayer. So if you could uh, just uh, keep your Keep your heart and mind focused on these prayer requests. Uh, first one is Rick Pinnock. This is Leisha's cousin uh, who had a, 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 a wreck the other day. He wasn't hurt in the wreck, but they didn't know exactly what was going on. They think maybe he had a seizure. Um, he's in the hospital. He is alert now, but he's got some problems with his kidneys. So please pray for him. They had to life flight him out of the mountains down south. So um, be in prayer for him. Uh, be in prayer for Jerry Campbell. That's uh, Kathy Campbell's husband. Uh, he had a pretty invasive surgery, I think about a week and a half ago, and then had to go back to the hospital yesterday uh, because it had opened up and he was bleeding. Um, they have sent him home, but he's, he's, they're, they're watching out for infection and stuff now. So be in prayer for Jerry. Uh, Becca Campbell, Kathy's granddaughter, who she takes care of, uh, has, uh, has had to go in for another spinal tap. She has fluid that gathers around her brain and it was about to cause her to go blind. So she's, she's uh, done with that procedure, but please pray for her. She's really been through it. Um, Pray to those uh, in the, the church family who are still homebound. Uh, pray that they would uh, be able to come and see us soon. And if you are friends with our homebound people, please make sure you're uh, staying in contact with them. Uh, if you're watching from home, we love you and we're praying for you. Uh, we are uh, praying for those who, who don't uh, have, want their name out, but uh, we do have people who are struggling with financial stress. We have people who are struggling with relational stress, medical and health obstacles. Um, so we want to pray for them. Uh, we want to pray for the churches all around us. Uh, if you don't know, the Methodist Church has a new pastor. We want to pray for him. We want to pray for the church that meets here earlier in the day. We want to pray, pray for the church plant in uh, Indianapolis that we support, Refuge Bible Church. Uh, there are so many churches that are doing what we're doing. They're, they're coming together. They're sharing the gospel. They're reaching the lost and the found with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we want to pray for, for all of them who are staying true to the word and true true to the Lord. Um, we want to most of all pray for the lost. Um, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have somebody or somebodies that they love who are not yet in the family of God. And uh, many of us have been through the ringer trying to figure things out on our own. And it was when we came to Christ, when we came to the family of God, when we said, I'm putting down all of what I used to be and I'm walking with, with God, that we found rescue, we found peace. And, and all of us can say that that peace is sometimes fleeting <laughs> when we get distracted by everything else again. But, but again, we love so many people who are not yet in the family and we just want to pray for them. Uh, so if you could uh, go ahead and pray with me. Father God, we love you so much and we are so thankful for your love. We thank you for, for the family that we get to be a part of. We thank you for this local church family. We also thank you for the, the, the global church, our brothers and sisters across denominational lines, across uh, national boundaries, uh, across all of this globe, who are worshiping you today. Lord, we want to be uh, specifically in prayer for those that we have mentioned, for those who are struggling with health or finances or relationships, Lord. And Lord, we want to come to you and beg you. Tackle the hearts of those who we love who are still not able to see you. Open their eyes so that they might see and be freed by you. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' perfect and precious name. And all God's people said, 
Amen. All right, I'm going to read one very quick psalm, and then we're going to get into praise uh, in, in the music uh, portion of our worship. If you're new to Warsaw Baptist Church, we worship in three primary ways. We worship in our giving, and that's not for you if you're a visitor or a guest, uh, but those of us who are in the family, we give. There's giving boxes here, or you can give online or through the mail. Uh, we worship in our singing, and we worship in the preaching and hearing of God's Word. So in Psalm 117, it's just two verses. It says, praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's do that now. Amen. And if you, if you are able, please stand with us and we'll sing together. Rolls up his sleeves, he just putting on the ritz. I got it's an awesome guy.
Amen. Good morning again. <laughs> we serve a great God, don't we? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be reading, which I'm not on the right page. You know, the professional that I am. I'm going to be reading for you Psalm 66, uh, verses 1 through 5. And they say, Shout joyfully to God, all you lands. Sing out the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth will worship you and will sing to you. And they will sing your name. And I just think that's, that's so true in our lives. If you look around you, you just... You can find something to praise God for in every moment, in everything around you. Despite life's obvious trials, there's always something to praise and worship God for. And I'm, I'm thankful that we can worship together this morning. Let's, let's shout to the Lord.
<sighs> Do you believe what we just sang? Yes. yes. Oh, we've all been through those dark days, but we've had somebody holding us up, and we praise the Lord for that. Um, before we get started with the sermon, we're going to release kids and uh, little kids to Nursery and Kids Church. If you're new here, we have uh, Kids Church every second and fourth Sunday. We have Nursery every Sunday of the month. Nursery goes up to kindergarten age. Uh, kids Church goes up to about fifth grade, but we don't really... Uh, Keep too close to an eye if they're a little older than that. Um, if you're brand new, if you don't want to release your kids, that's fine. We understand they are more than welcome to sit in here. We don't mind babies crying. We don't mind any of that. Uh, it's a sign of a healthy church. Amen? All right, so let's pray, and then we'll release them. Father God, we thank you for your love and all of the truth that we just sang. We thank you that we have a place to come in the midst of all the storms of our life. We thank you that we have a place to come where there are like-minded believers who are, who are just traveling down this hard road together. Lord, we do not deny the brokenness, but we, t we face it head on because we have you. Lord, as we release the children into children's church and nursery, I pray for the, the, the workers, the teachers, and I pray for every child who goes back. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as the parents and caretakers and, and caregivers to know that our job is to shape and mold these children in the way they should go, to follow and obey the Lord, and to be shot out like arrows into this dark world. Lord, help us to prepare them for that. That is the first area that we are called to disciple. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to take that weight and that responsibility seriously. And also know that you do all the heavy lifting. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Kids, you can go. And if everybody else can turn to the book of Zephaniah. If you don't know where Zephaniah is, I understand that. It is three chapters. And it is a short book in the Minor Prophets. Um, if you're in a pew Bible, there should be hardback pew bibles near you in the pews uh that'll be on page 788 uh, is where it starts and uh if you're not in a pew bible just uh, uh look around it's if if you get to any of the new testament matthew mark luke and john just go left a few pages and uh and you'll find it zephaniah not zachariah zephaniah and we're gonna start today by just reading one verse chapter one verse seven and if you uh, want, we'll also have it on the screen. I'll be jumping to a few different texts today, so if you want to follow along just on the screen, that's fine as well. Once you're there, go ahead and uh, stand for the reading of God's Word. And uh, if you're new to church, the reason we stand is to show reverence to the, the, the God who gave us this Word, but also just to push away the distractions that we might have come in here with. Zephaniah chapter 1, starting in verse 7, well, verse 7. It says, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we sang, I was just reminded of your majesty, your power, your strength. I was reminded of your love for us. I was reminded of the sure guarantees that we have in your word. Today, as we unpack some of those guarantees, both warnings and promises of blessing that we see in the book of Zephaniah, I pray that you would be with us. Lord, I pray that you would push away anything that gets in the way of your word being absorbed into our minds, into our hearts in a way that causes our feet and hands and lives to look different, to do different. Lord, this book, like no other, begs us to look forward, begs us to look to the day of the Lord. Lord, I've prepared a message, but I pray that you would just get me out of the way and, and anything you want said. I pray that you would bridge that gap between my mouth and the ears of the hearers. Holy Spirit, we know that you are here. Some of us cannot feel you tangibly because we are here with so many cares and concerns of this world. 
Some of us cannot feel your spirit because we have not yet submitted our lives and our hearts to you through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. No matter what might be hindering your spirit from being tangibly felt, I pray that you would get those things out of the way. Bring people to faith, wash away distractions, and help us, help us, Lord, to see you in your word. Lord, I've read ahead, and I know that this book will be a Brillo pad to some of our hearts, scraping off the gunk of our lives. But I also know that this book is a a healing salve for those of us whose hearts are broken. Help us, Lord, to see it all as a beautiful gift from God our King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, have a seat. We're going to dig in. Today we're talking about the day of the Lord. And as I was reflecting on this, I was, uh, I was just struck by things that I see in my life. Maybe you are like me. Maybe I'm like you. Here's what I've seen in my life. You just think and say, okay, is this something that I deal with too? I am, I have been in the past, but I still am sometimes so easily distracted by unimportant timelines. Like unimportant things grip my attention and shape how I think, how I live, how I move, the things I say, the things I don't, the way I act and react, it's all shaped by deadlines. And when I was a newspaper photographer, it was literal deadlines. Like every day, paper had to go out. Next day, people throw it away. But that day, I had to make sure there was art on the front page, you know, whether there was news happening or not. And those deadlines shaped everything around my life. I had to meet that daily deadline. Now I've got a deadline every Sunday. You know, no matter who I've counseled, who I've visited in the hospital, Sunday's coming. And I better not come up here and say, well, I don't really have anything to tell you. I I have to have something to tell you. Um, But it's not just work deadlines. It's also things like entertainment. Um, I don't know if any of you remember when they used to actually release albums. It was like a big thing, like on the... 14th of July, this album. I used to just wait and wait and wait for the next album from my, and and that was like an actual uh, piece of material, not just a digital download, but I waited and waited for the album to come out. Um, How many of you have have waited for the, the summer to be over so that the next season of your favorite show can start? I wait and wait and wait. We wait for these things. Sometimes it's just for materials kind of nebulously, right? Like, I like guitars. I'm not a good guitar player, but I like guitars. And sometimes I will just, and and this happened recently, sometimes I will just see an ad for a guitar and then I'll just think, when could I have that? And I start trying to figure out all kinds of things. And that weight shapes things like how I spend my money and don't spend my money, how I do this and that. All of us, I think, have this sort of thing happen. We have positive things that we wait for that shape us, right? You know, you might be saying, okay, in three weeks, I get to take my vacation. Finally, I get to go in three weeks. You might say, um, you know, the, the big game is this weekend. I don't understand that, but some of you really like basketball and that sort of thing. You might say, I can't wait. The, 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 the you know, whatever. I was going to try to talk sports, but I don't know. But, but some of you really like that. Maybe it is your TV show. Maybe, maybe you are waiting to start that new job that you've been just begging God to get, and you're saying, okay, when I start that job, things are going to be different. Sometimes we have negative things that we are waiting on that shape us. I can't believe I have 20 more years to pay on my mortgage. I've got 11 more years before I can think of retiring or whatever yours is, right? I've got all these things that I'm waiting for. Sometimes it's, it's waiting for something that we don't know when that thing is going to happen, right? Uh, you might be waiting for a doctor's report to come in and, you know, now we have all these digital options and before the doctor calls, you might be able to check on your phone, you know, what, what the report is. But how often do you just... You just get owned by that weight for that doctor's report, 
for you or for somebody that you love. Some of us are, are waiting. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad was in the Navy. He was out to sea a lot. So I remember months on end just waiting. When's he going to get to come home? And he had a date that he was getting to come home. But when you're a kid, you don't know what that is. It's just someday out there, dad's coming home. You might be like m- many of us in this church who say, when will my loved one finally get clean and stay clean? Get sober and stay sober. We all have these things that we wait for. And and here's why this matters. Nearly everything we're waiting on, nearly everything we're waiting on, whether you're waiting for a sandwich when I'm done talking or whether you're waiting for a new job, everything we wait on shapes the way we are thinking, shapes what we plan, shapes how we spend, shapes how we speak, shapes, shapes how we react, Everything is shaped by that thing we're waiting on. Everything. Whether it's a big thing or a little thing, everything is shaped by that. It dictates that our life is dictated by what we wait for, what we know is coming. Uh, When I was in the Army, I knew how long somebody had until their enlistment was up because they got more and more patient with all the nonsense that we dealt with in the Army. When you're, when you're a year in and you're dealing with the nonsense, you're like, I can't believe I've got three more years of this. I can't do it. But when you've got like two weeks, you're like, you know what? Life goes on. And you drive everybody else crazy because you're just patient because you know your, your wait is almost over. I've never, uh, thank the Lord, I've never been in prison, but I've known quite a few people who have. And I've been told that the people you want to watch out for when you're in prison are the people who don't really have a day that they're getting out. They have nothing to look to and say, okay, well, I better behave because I might get that time shortened or I better behave because of whatever. If there's not a time that they're getting out for whatever choices they've made, they just have less to lose. Kids, this is generalized. I don't know if it's for every kid, but... My wife will tell you that my kids are less argumentative when they know dad's about to get home. Any other moms that can say that? I don't know what it is. Like, you might be a more stern mom than I am a dad, but there's just something about knowing dad's coming home. Oh, I better, I better shape up. And when we look in the Bible, and I encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, see me after the service. I'll get you a Bible. When we look in the Bible... Page after page has God saying, yes, that is exactly how I designed you. I designed you to be shaped by what you wait on. I've designed you to, 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 to shape and base your right now on the what's coming. Everything in your life is shaped on what's coming. Right now, what you're doing. You might be here today because of what you're hoping might happen in the future. Everything, Jesus, God points us to, this is how you are hardwired. This is how you are designed. But we get off track when we miss the big thing that's coming for lesser things that are coming. We get off track when we, when we focus on the maybe these things will come versus the absolutely guaranteed these things are going to happen. Does that make sense? Has anybody had their right now shaped by something that is coming and that thing never came? Like you worried and worried and worried about this person's reaction to fill in the blank and then you got to the interaction and they, they, they had their own life to worry about. They, they really didn't care about you and your thing. But your right now for all those days leading up to it were shaped by that worry. We get off track when we think about the what's to come and we're thinking about things that are so much less than or non-existent compared to the thing that is guaranteed to happen. And what Zephaniah is telling us is that we are to, you know, not forget about all those other things. Don't forget about the fact that you have a work deadline. Don't forget about the fact that your kids need to be fed dinner. Don't forget about the things that have to happen. But make sure that the big E on the I chart is eternity. Make sure that when you're looking 
forward, you're looking forward to the day of the Lord. This is what Zephaniah talks about over and over and over in these three short chapters. He talks about the day of the Lord. We read the first time he talks about it in verse 7, where he says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. 17 times in three chapters, he talks about this day that's coming. He says, I'm just going to rattle them off. He says, it is the day of the Lord, that day. In other words, forget all the other days. That day is the one you got to worry about. The great day of the Lord. And then it gets really dark. The day of wrath, a day of distress, a day of anguish, a day of ruin, a day of devastation, a day of darkness, a day of gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry, a day of the wrath of the Lord, a day of the anger of the Lord. And and, and finally, in chapter 3, verse 8, he says, it is the day when I, God, will rise up and seize my prey. It's dark for the first two and a half chapters. But I want to encourage you, don't, don't be pushed away from God's word because of the parts that are dark. Don't be pushed away from God's word by the parts that are hard to look at. Instead, see what God is doing here. See, because the end of the book of Zephaniah is brilliant and glowing with hope and gospel encouragement and promises of blessing. But just like a a, a jeweler, if you're uh, going to to buy a ring for your sweetie and you want to look at all the different stones and stuff, a good jeweler will put the stones, the rings, the jewelry on a piece of black cloth. Do you know why? Because when the light hits it and there's nothing around it but, but it and it's just black, then that shines all the more. It looks more brilliant. It looks more beautiful. And Zephaniah, for the first two and a half chapters, just he's just pulling down not just a black cloth, but a black curtain across everything. And he says, just so you know, at the end, if you're not with God, it is very, very dark. And that day, when it gets very dark, is coming. Guaranteed. It's not one of those things we worry about, never happens. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. But if you are in Christ... If you have the promises that we were, are going to see in this book, then all of the darkness just makes the glory of his promise more beautiful. Does that make sense? That makes sense? That's, that's where we're going. So again, before we get into this, I just want to, want to tell you, hold on till the end, because I know the first part is rough. But really, uh, how we look at the day of the Lord, how we actually long for Christ's return, Wayne Gruden says it's a, it's a measuring stick for our spiritual condition in the here and now. So, so I guarantee if you are struggling with some habitual sin, you just can't seem to shake this thing that you keep on doing, I can guarantee, I can use that as a ruler that says, you are not thinking about the day of the Lord. If you are struggling with, I know I should be an evangelist. I know every one of us is called to go and make disciples. But, you know, I just don't feel like it's that urgent. That's a, that's a measuring stick that says you aren't thinking about the day of the Lord. If you are uh, allowing your relationship to just be broken by all of this just piddly nitpicking... Or if you're allowing yourself to, to, to be owned by someone else's opinion of you, someone else who is also broken, someone else who is also fleeting, that's a measuring stick that shows me, shows us that we are not looking forward and longing for the day of the Lord. It's an indication that we don't really believe in the moment that it's coming. Now, if I ask any Christian in this room, I'm sure you say, yes, I believe the day of the Lord is coming. But most of us live our lives as though it's never going to happen when we're around, right? Like this is, this is one of the problems that we have as the church. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, this is, this is really just me ripping the roof off so you can see all the junk in our messy house, Right? When we don't think about the day of the Lord, all these piddly things of the day around us 
own us. The day is laid out as a warning mainly for God's people. If you, I'm not going to cover all this scripture, but you can take notes. The first uh, thing I want to see is that in chapter 1, 4 through 13, and then in chapter 3, 1 through 8, this is a warning for the church, for God's people, for Israel, for Judah. All right, so it's not for the nations. It's not for those heathens somewhere else. It's for these Warsaw Baptist church folk right here, for us. It's for us. It's a warning for us. And then, sandwiched in between that, Nehemiah, or Zephaniah, not Nehemiah, Zephaniah warns the other nations. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 15, you can just take a note and read it later. He warns the other nations. And if you look at where these nations were on the map, it's basically to the north, to the south, to the east, to the, to, to the, to the, to the east, my east, your west. Everywhere you look, judgment is coming. The day of the Lord is going to come on everyone. And some pastors who have read through this and preached through this, people who are smarter than I am, say the real reason that the nations are warned here is so that the people of God can see that no matter which way they try to run from God, they're going to face God. And so it's a warning to the nations, but it's a warning to God's people to say, when you find yourself in sin, when you find yourself in rebellion, when you find yourself worried about the world instead of worried about the Lord, don't run away from him in that moment. Run to him. Because if we run away from him, there's nothing good about the day of the Lord. But if we run to him, if we run to the Lord, there are promises to be had. Now, another thing that you need to know is that Zephaniah writes in this really weird way that is common to the prophets. So he'll be talking about something that is pretty current to his lifetime, the nations who are right around him, the peoples in that moment. But then he'll zoom way to the future, to the very end of this age, the very end when Jesus comes back and everything's wiped out. And then he zooms back to current events. And then he zooms back to the very end. And and, uh, there's a guy who writes a lot about end times, and that's a whole other topic. But he he points out that the prophets were little interested in chronology. You know, so if, if if you hate those movies where they have flashback, flash forward, flashback, flash forward, you'll hate the prophets because that's all they do. They don't care about a solid timeline. The Old Testament prophets blended near and distant perspectives so as to form like a single canvas. So it'd be like if I could paint and I painted a mural of the American, the history of America. It'd be like if I painted a picture of Kennedy getting assassinated, followed by the Revolutionary War, and then the election of whoever your favorite president was. Just like, just zooming back and forth, back and forth. That's what Zephaniah does. So, so I don't have time to unpack everything that he does or, or, or keep telling you about the zooming in and zooming out, but, but here's the thing I don't want you to miss, okay? So this passage, the thing I'm preaching, it's just to whet your appetite, to read this for yourself. And here's what I don't want you to miss as you read this for yourself. A lot of this book is bad news. It's bad news of punishment and destruction. In fact, let's look at one passage that sort of spells that out. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 12. This is to Jerusalem. This is to Judah. This is to God's people. This is to the church. Zephaniah says, and this is the words of the Lord through Zephaniah the prophet, I will stretch out my hand against Judah. And against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. And the name of the idolatrous priest along with the priests. Those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord. And yet also swear by Milcom. Your passage might say Molech. Those who have turned their back from following the Lord. Who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Let me just stop there. Why is God bringing judgment? Why is God bringing the day of the Lord at one day when he's going to take care of all of it? And why does he allow consequences of sin to happen in the here and now? 
Well, the reason he was doing it for Jerusalem and Judah, and just ask yourself, is this true of me, is because of idolatry. It says that these places that he had made his place for his people were being corrupted and profaned by worship of other gods. And, and listen, a lot of pastors, they want to say, and look at America. We've got Christians, but we've got all these other pagans. This is written not to everybody. It's written to God's people. It's written to those of us who, who say, yes, I love the Lord. Look at, look at again in verse uh, 5 at the end. We bow down and swear to the Lord and yet also swear by Milcom or Molech, depending on your translation. Do you know who that is? That's the God who they would sacrifice children to. They would have a statue of this God, little g God, with arms outstretched and in the hands that were, that were constantly heated by fire, they would place their living children and they would burn to death. God's people were doing this. And we can say, oh man, why in the world? What, what, a, what a nasty, primitive way to be. But you realize that the abortion industry is not only fueled by non-Christians who get pregnant, right? You realize that Christians go to the abortion clinics and say, you know what? I love the Lord, but I really want a career, and this is going to get in the way. I love the Lord, but if, if, if everybody finds out I'm pregnant, then I'm going to be in, in trouble with the people who actually know me in church. One of the saddest things I ever heard was a person who worked at a crisis pregnancy center saying, this girl comes in and she says, I, I had to have an abortion. She's, she's going for counseling after she's had it and she's dealing with all the guilt and the regret. I had to do it because if my church knew that I had gotten pregnant, I would have been tossed out because I wasn't married. Is it a sin? To get pregnant when you're not married? To have sex outside of marriage? Yes. The Bible says it is. Are we going to love you right through that? Yes. This is a place. If, if church isn't a place where broken people can come and say, I'm broken, then where else can we go? I mean, if we go out to the world, they will just tell you, no, there's nothing broken about that. Do whatever you want as the wreckage just piles up and piles up and piles up in our lives and in our culture. And the church will say, yeah, that was sin. Repent and believe. Walk with us. Walk through this. This baby is a, is a gift from God, no matter how it came about. But God's people bowed down to him and then also bowed down to this child-sacrificing religion. They turned their back from following the Lord. They did not seek of the Lord or inquire of him. They did not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Is this something that we can say is an issue in the Christian life now? They do not seek the Lord nor inquire of him. When the last financial difficulty came into your life, when the last health obstacle came into your life, when the last relational Turmoil came into your life, whether that was with a parent or a child or a spouse. When the last work issue came into your life, did you, did we inquire of the Lord and seek his will for us in that situation? Or did we seek the world's answers? Did we seek our own way of digging ourselves out of the hole? God is telling us through Zephaniah, it is not okay to run to everyone but him for answers. Now, there's wisdom in financial things to talk to somebody who knows about finances. But every financial issue I've had in my life, every relational issue I've had in my life has also been at the root a gospel issue. Every time. They don't seek the Lord or inquire of him. 
So then he does. He says, be silent before the Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. And then there's this promise that we'll get back to. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And then he continues with the judgment. He says, on that day, the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. In other words, when God goes to judge anyone, he first goes to the leaders who should have been leading the people in a better direction. That's weighty for anybody who says, I feel like I should be preaching. I think I should pastor. God will hold us to a stricter account. On that day I will punish, verse 9, everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. If you're wondering what this leaping over the threshold is, anybody wondering what that means? Everybody knows? Well, here's what it means. Um, There was a time when there was a king, a good king, David, good-ish King David of the Israelites. And before he became king, they were just basket cases. And and one time when they were going out to battle, they said, well, we we need some help with this battle. So they didn't go to the Lord and ask for the Lord's protection. They just took the Ark of the Covenant, which was part of of their worship to God and they used it basically like a good luck charm and they said well if we have the ark with us we're fine well they weren't fine they were routed and the Philistines took the ark and took it to their city and they put it in the 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 temple of their fake god Dagon I think his name and they thought we won we won look what we did And then the next morning they come in and their false god statue is bowing face down next to the ark. So I said, this isn't going to do. So they put it back up. By the way, if you have to put your god back up on his pedestal, he's he's not a good god. So they put him back up and they say, okay, okay, yeah, 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 we're we're great. The next day, face is down on, on the ground by the ark, but the rest of the statue is just crumbled into pieces. And part of the pieces were on the threshold, the doorway into the temple. And so from then on, it says that the Philistines, as, as kind of a uh, superstitious act, they would hop over the threshold. They wouldn't, they wouldn't step on the threshold, they'd hop over it. Like this seems maybe silly to us, but God hates superstition. When we, when we go to superstitious things, even if it's just something we grew up with and everybody does and nobody even thinks about it, when we do that, we're saying, I'm going to trust this instead of trusting God. Does anybody knock on wood for good luck? Stop it. According to, not, not according to Ken, according to Zephaniah and God, Stop it. Don't knock on wood. Don't throw salt over your shoulder. If you spill it, it's just salt. If you break a mirror, go buy another one. It's just a mirror. Ladders, I should stay away from ladders, but, but it doesn't matter if you walk under a ladder. Superstitions are stupid and sinful according to God. Again, not according to me. If your mama did it all the time you were growing up, okay. You stop it. You've heard the word. Maybe she never heard the word. Stop knocking on wood for good luck. On that day, verse 10 declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish The men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, listen, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods will be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. So what's his problem? His problem is, they've said, we believe there's a God. We just don't believe that he cares about any of this. You may have heard of people who do believe that the universe was created by an intelligent designer, but they they basically just make them a watchmaker that winds up the watch and walks away. 
instead of knowing that the God of the universe is intimately concerned with every decision. He knows about every hair on our head. He knows about every sparrow who falls. He is intimately in, in, in relationship with us. And so, so these are problems that God has with his people. And he sends this warning. But this warning is not the end of days warning. Like it's going to get bad for them. If you know the history of Israel, it gets really, really bad for them. But not wiping them out off of the face of the earth bad. Right? It gets bad for them, but there is a promise of restoration. There is a promise that there will be a remnant that is saved. But then Zephaniah zooms to the day. And he's basically saying, listen, all of these hard things that we go through are warnings to us. They're, they're flags, they're flares being shot up by God saying, look, 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 look. It's only going to get worse if you're not mine. And so he says to the Israelites, listen, and, and, and I'm going to skip the part where he goes after all the other countries, but I'm going to zoom into the very end of that. He says, listen, I have cut off, this is chapter 3, verse 6, I have cut off the nations, north, south, east, west. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste to their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. And here's God's heart. He says, I, sh I said, surely they will fear me. And you will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. He says all of that stuff that's been hard on the world and on you is just to get your attention so that you will stop looking to the world and to yourself and look up to him. And then he zooms in to the day. He says, because you will not listen, because you will not repent, because you will not trust me. Verse 8, therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. How would, how would our lives change? How would your life change? Just you sitting in the pew, you watching from home. How would your life change? How would our lives change if we really believed that a day like that was coming? Most of you in this room, most of you watching are probably Christians. You might say, well, I know that it gets better real quick. I know that the very next verse is beautiful. So I'm not really worried about that day. I'm glad that day is coming. But every one of us who is a Christian has a neighbor, has a classmate, has a coworker, has family members who will not have joy on this day. How would our life change if we really believed that was near? If you're, if you're here, you're watching, and you're not a believer, I'm begging you, understand this is full of promises. This is full of promises for us to be blessed, for you to be blessed if you will turn to Christ and, and, and just repent and believe. But this book is also full of warnings for you. That day of the Lord is coming for all of us. How would your life change today if you believe that? Would you finally repent of your way and trust in his? Would you finally open your mouth to that classmate that maybe right now is on your mind? To that family member that right now is on your mind? Would you, for the family members and people who have said, I don't want to hear anything more about Jesus, would this cause you to get on your face with tears in your eyes and just say, please, God, they won't listen to me. Send somebody they'll listen to. I've got brothers who do not believe this. And my heart mourns for that. I've got brothers who have said, when you talk about this, the conversation's over. And so I am begging God, 
send somebody that they'll listen to. Send somebody that they won't shut off. And Lord, please do it before they have to go through the kind of pain that I had to go through to get it. What would your life look like if you really believed the end was near? Now, I'm not wearing a sandwich board sign. You've seen those guys in the city, right, with the big board that says the end is near and they look just crazed and they're shouting at people. I'm not that guy. But whether or not Jesus tarries another week or another thousand years, today is the day, if, if calculations are correct, for 153,000 people to die. Today. Today, 153,000 people will have their day of reckoning. Whether or not Jesus comes back, their day, when all chances are gone to repent and believe, is over. It might be you, it might be your neighbor, it might be your mama. As I was preparing this sermon, I had lunch with a, a Christian brother of mine. And he always asked me, how's, how's the sermon coming, Ken? And Thursday, all I could tell him is, I have what I think is a holy angst. Do you know what angst is? I have a holy, almost dread. Like, I, I, I don't know how to convey the weight of this book. That's why before I started preaching, I was praying, Lord, bridge the gap. Bridge the gap between my words and the hearts of those who are hearing. There was a holy heartbreak. Because if you just don't think about how many people are going to die today, think about right now. Think about this hour that we're together. 6,300 people in this hour are going to die. Across the globe, 6,300 people in an hour. And I know that as I say that, and if I'm not talking about you, just let it go. But I know that as I say that 6,300 people are going to die in the next hour, in this hour together, some of you are mourning more about the hour you are not doing what you want to do and you're stuck here listening to a preacher. You're more concerned with an hour than you are concerned with 6,300 lost souls. But I'm no different. Like, I'm not picking on you and saying, you should be more like me. I'm no different. As I was studying this text about the end, I spent hours and hours on to days and days. The first two days of my sermon prep was just reading and, and arguing with old dead guys about, about how this is all going to end. So we know it's going to end. So is it going to be with a rapture? Is it going to be a rapture before there's tribulation? Is there going to be a, a halfway through tribulation, uh, then we're raptured out? Or are we going to have to go through all the tribulation and then be raptured out? Is there a millennium kingdom after Jesus comes back? Or are we kind of living in a millennium right now? All those things are important to, to, to study and know. But people are dying, and I spent two days just having a theological nerd fest on this stuff. That is important, but it's not key. See, Jesus doesn't say the end is coming, so argue with people about the rapture. He doesn't say the end is coming, so argue with people about what we need to do to be ready in that blink of an eye. He says the end is coming, so go make disciples. Yes and amen. I talk about that a lot. Right? A lot. Probably you're sick of hearing it. Go make disciples. This is, this is, this is our mar marching orders. But what I looked at as I looked at this text and then looked at the New Testament is I saw that not only should we be making disciples, but we should also, in the same moment, be longing for that return. Like we should, as Christians, be saying, God, just come. Come soon. Come now. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, it's one of the last passages in the Bible. God says, Jesus says to John, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And John responds, amen, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Do you long for that? Do you long for him to just 
just come, just split the sky open, come now, I'm done. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Look at this. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Waiting for our blessed hope. Again, we are shaped, we live by what we're waiting for. Are you waiting for your glorious hope of Christ returning? Like how much has that owned your life, your heart, your mind today? Before I start talking about you should do this. Before I started reading Zephaniah, I was concerned about all kinds of other stuff. Leaks in the roof. Family squabbles. Even pastors have family squabbles. I was concerned with all kinds of things. The Bible says, long for, wait for this day. In Titus where it says, waiting for the day, it's the same word that, you remember the story of Jesus when he was born, they took him to the temple and this old man grabs him and says, finally, I've been waiting my whole life for this moment, the consolation of Israel. He was waiting his whole life. He was yearning for, hungering for, desiring this moment when he would see the Messiah. Is there a yearning like that in your heart for that day? Now, if you're here and you are hearing that the day of the Lord is a day of destruction and you're not a believer, you might say, why in the world would you be waiting for that? Why would you hope for that? Why would you long for that? Why would you hunger for that? It's not because we're psychotic. It's not because we hate you if you're not a Christian. It's because we understand that it is only through the destruction of the day of the Lord that finally we can enter into a time of peace. It is only when God burns up everything that is dross that we can walk in purity. And we know that part of that purging process on the day of the Lord is not just going to be sinners out there. It's going to be the sin in here. And I cannot wait for the day when he burns all that up and I am just a pure-hearted worshiper. Because as I'm sitting here singing to the Lord... Even in that moment, I'm distracted. I just want to have a pure heart and worship him. I want to to look out at my brothers and sisters in Christ and say, we're done battling. We're done battling the sin that has gripped us. We're done battling the sin in here and all around us. There will not be another news report of another child dying. There will not be another news report of animals mistreated. There won't be another news report of whatever it is that breaks your heart that is on a constant loop in our world. We long for that day of the Lord because we know that it is through that purging fire that we get the new heavens and the new earth. So just real quickly, I know we're running long. Let me read you what happens after the destruction. Let me read to you what happens after the brokenness is no more. And I just want to ask you, as I read this, just listen. Do you long for a day like this? Chapter 3, verses 9 and following says, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to pure speech that all of them that call on the name of the Lord will serve him with one accord. Do you long for a day when you're not hearing filth come out of people's mouth, when you're not hearing backbiting and slander and gossip, when you're not hearing all the things that are wrong, when you just hear pure speech? Do you long for the day that will come when there will be unity When everyone will be of one accord? I mean, just in the church. We argue about so many piddly things in the church. 
Monica and I have friends who are, who are baptizing their children today in a Reformed church that baptizes infants. Not for salvation, just to say they're a part of the family. I don't agree with it, but you know what? We're going to be there. And we're going to love them, and we're going to thank God that they are wanting to raise their kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I'll just look at it like a baby dedication. And I know they're going to raise them to fear and, and, and adore the Lord. We argue about whether we should have drums up here in the church. Not this church, but in the church. We argue about that. We argue about what letters are on the outside of your Bible instead of the fact that you're holding a Bible and reading it for yourself. We argue about whether or not a pastor should wear a tie or have tattoos or any of that nonsense. It's nonsense. One day there will be complete unity. We will all be of one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because the deeds because of the deeds by which you rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones. Do you long for the day when you will never feel shame again for the things you've done? Like I've done things that I know God has forgiven me for that still weigh heavy on my heart. Anybody else? Like I've done things that I know everyone around me has forgiven me for. But I still have shame when I think about it. How about you? Do you long for that day when he says, you will not be put to shame even by yourself for the deeds with which you have rebelled against him? He goes on to say, you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Do you long for the day when your own pride doesn't get in the way of your relationships? Has anybody made really stupid decisions because of their pride? I just can't admit that I was wrong. I can't admit that I can't do something and I need help. Do you long for that day when you are no longer haughty, you are no longer proud? And you can just say, like, we're all here because we're all lousy and we know it. We're all here because all of us looked to the cross and said, that's what I deserved. When we get to heaven, there will be no I'm better than you-ism. None. It's gone. I long for that day. He says, I will live in your midst, the people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies. For there shall be found in their mouth, no, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Do you long for a day when you're not afraid anymore? Who's afraid of financial issues right now? I see your hands. Who, who's afraid of relationship issues right now? You don't know what might come next. Who's afraid for your kids who are about to grow up and go out of the house? Honestly. Who's afraid because you're about to have a kid? I see your hands. Who's afraid about their job? Do you long for a day when that fear is gone? Like I tell my mom all the time. I, tell, I used to tell my grandma, and she would, she would finally say, I know, don't worry, pray. I can say that to other people, but I get turned around the spoke with my worry and my fear. It's easy to tell somebody else what to do, right? Do you long for the day when there's no more fear? Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Because the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never fear evil again. I love it. 
On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Let me just stop there. Among those of us who who love Jesus, who know we're saved, know that God loves us, how many of us just cannot grasp the idea that he would look at us in all our faults and failures and rejoice over us? Anybody else have trouble like getting that wrapped around your brain? Like when you sing over and exalt over someone else, it's because they've pleased you somehow. When God looks at me, he sees a wretched sinner who daily needs to run back to the cross and say, again, Lord, help me. And it says he will rejoice over us. How is that possible? It's possible because what we read in the verse before. He has taken away the judgments against you. When God the Father sees you, he doesn't see sinful you. He sees the perfect, redeemed child. When he looks at you, he looks at you like those parents that you just can't understand. Like everybody around them knows that their kids are rotten, but when they see their kids, they're just like, they can do no wrong, I love them. That's how God is with you. Not because he's unaware but because he's cleansed you. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, I will gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes. The reason Christians, if, you don't, if you're not a Christian, you don't understand. The reason we as Christians long for this day when we look at it is because we know on the other side it is a good day. And if you're here or you're watching and you're not a Christian and you are afraid of what the Bible says that day holds for you, I'm here to tell you, you don't need to fear. All you have to do is turn to the Lord who's made a sacrifice for you. The truth is, we all deserve the wreckage of the day of the Lord. But if you put all the wreckage on Christ and believe that he took every bit of the wrath For you on that day of anger, you won't receive a drop of his anger, of his wrath. You will receive grace and mercy and glory and praise. If you're here and you're not a Christian, if you're watching and you're not a Christian, I'm just begging you. The Bible continues to hold out that if you turn to the Lord in repentance, which just means turning away from whatever sin you're dealing with, And faith, which just means trusting God. You have nothing to fear on the day of the Lord. Amen? This is the promise. Let's pray. Father God, God, give us a holy desperation. For those of us and those in our lives who don't know you yet, give us a holy desperation, a holy angst, a holy heartbreak for them. Give us a holy desperation for and about that day that is coming. Let that desperation burn away and choke out all of the worldliness in our life. Let that desperation and that understanding that the Lord, the day of the Lord is coming, let that choke out and burn up all the sin in our life, all the idleness in our life. And Lord, by the power of your word and the power of your spirit in the preached word, inflame our hearts and our tongues and our feet to go and make disciples and and show why you should long for this day. God, help us gain and keep an eye on eternity 
when all these other things try to choke out that view. Lord God, help us to gain and keep an eye on eternity as the seconds of this life pass by. Every time we blink, the world is one blink closer to the end. Help stoke a holy discontentment with anything that would be church as an event, church as something we do, somewhere we go. Just burn that away and help us to see that we are a church on mission to reach the lost. Lord, push away anything that is church as usual and bring us as a family to you and for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. I love you guys. Let's sing. All right, everybody, if you could please stay with us. We're going to sing Joy to the World. Joy to the World, the Lord is come. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want you to go and be the church. I want you to go and live in light of eternity. If you're here and you need to talk, if you need prayer, please come see me after we're dismissed. I love you so much. And I want you to love the Lord and love others. That's my heart's desire for you. So go be the church. You're dismissed.